we want to honor Sam Kaikala. Sam, a part of our church, part of our family in our church, went home to be with the Lord this morning. 6 a.m. this morning, he went home to be with the Lord. And so I want us to pray for the family and pray for our church. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Sam is in your hands and he's in your care. And God, that we're in his future. Lord, we pray for strength and wisdom for the family as they navigate this time of change. The suddenness of loss. So Lord, we thank you that you're the God of peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Kai Kalas, we love you. Praying with you. Today, uh, we're going to continue in our series, the book of John, and uh, we're going to be talking about the power of passion. The power of passion. And so we're going to jump over to John chapter 2, and we're going to enter verse 13. And this is the account where it was during the Passover season, the celebration, and Jesus goes to the temple. He goes to the house of God. And he sees some things that are not supposed to be in the house of God. He sees that people have changed the intent and the purpose of the house of God. And he sees this and he is not able to let it rest. And I pray that we as born again believers can come to a place where when we see things that are creeping into the house of God, we will not let them rest but we will deal with them sharply because we know that God's house is meant to be a place of prayer, a place of communion, a place to communicate and to connect with our heavenly father. So we pick it up in verse 14. It says in the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money or foreign currency. Jesus then made a whip from some ropes and chased them out of the temple. He drove them out, the sheep, the cattle, scattered the money changers, their coins over the floor, and then turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And then the disciples remembered the Old Testament scripture, the prophecy saying, passion for God's house will consume me. Passion for God's house will consume me. Now, let me break this down a little bit because this wasn't just a, a quick momentary encounter that he had in the temple. Turn me down just a little bit, please. And so you have to understand first, Jesus encountered the simple fact that people were charging they were being charged a tax, a temple tax, just to come in to the temple. Just to get in, you had to pay a tax. And not only did you have to pay a tax, you had to use temple currency, which nobody used temple currency except the temple. So what did you have to do? You had to go and exchange your currency into temple currency for a 15% fee. And then you would bring your sacrifice in to have it sacrificed. But of course, that has to be inspected first. And when they inspected it by the temple inspectors, they found something wrong with it. And said, well, you can't use this animal for your sacrifice. But if you look over here, we have a whole herd of animals to pick from. And they were charging them 10 times the amount of what they would normally cost. They were extorting their people. And then all of the animals were sitting in the outer court, the Gentile court. This is where the Gentiles would come to meet God and pray to God. But it was very difficult to do when you're standing in a barnyard filled with cattle and sheep and the, the, the mooing and, and, and the buying of the sheep. It was a demeaning process. And Jesus saw this and he did something about it. Why? Because he said, passion for the house of God will be the end of me. I'm putting it all on the line for the house of God. Now, passion, when we look at it here, the original definition, which was, you know, in the early centuries, meaning having a cause that is greater than the pain you were dealing with, having a cause that is greater than the pain that you're going to deal with. 
And Jesus had a cause that was greater than the pain that he was going to deal with. You know, he said, for the joy that is set before me, he endured the cross. That is a passion that will enable you to endure pain and hardship and suffering in order to get to something good. Passion here means zeal. In the original uh, King James, it used the word zeal, but it literally means passion, being zealous. Um, it's an inner feeling of boiling over from heat. Another person called it a spirit-fueled zeal to serve the Lord. A spirit-fueled zeal. In other words, my fervency and my passion for God's house will be my undoing. There's nothing more important to me than the house of God. That's what Jesus is saying. Why? Because the joy that was set before him. Anybody remember the movie, The Passion of the Christ? That helps us understand, better have the context to understand when it says the passion of the Christ. It's the, 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 the commitment and the zeal in his heart to endure something that nobody else could have endured. See, passion gives us strength to endure difficult things. P passion will keep you committed rather than being committed. You know, being put in the white jacket and put in the padded room. Right? What, what would normally make some people crazy, it'll just keep you fueled. That's what passion will do in your heart. Now, the modern meaning to passion literally means to be consumed by fire or to be on fire. So when you look at Jesus and his passion for the house of God, you know, th that whole term that he made a whip, he didn't go buy one. He didn't take one off of somebody's table. He went and he made a whip. It takes time to make a whip. You see, passion will keep your emotions and your feelings in check. Jesus just didn't lose his head and go out and start doing this. This was a calculated plan. And passion caused him to sit down and make a whip and not lose his head. When you have passion from God, you just don't run off half cocked. So what did he do? He made a plan. Passion will give you a plan. He also, with that passion, it caused him to turn over some things that other people didn't want to touch. Now, it's interesting because the account says that he first scattered the money onto the floor. He took them and he, he wiped the money onto the ground. What do you think the money changers did as soon as their money hit the ground? Guess what? When you got a lot of money changers and you got everybody's money getting commingled on the ground, guess what? It's free for all. And what that does is it frees up the tables. You can throw them over. They were no, no longer there to protect the tables because what they were after was the money and he threw the money on the floor and then he went over and he turned the tables. And then what happened? He took that whip and he drove out things that other people tolerated and ignored. There's something passionate that can be within us to deal with things that we've normally not dealt with before. There, there's something within us that God can fuel and ignite within our hearts to, to have strength to face things that we've never faced before. And my question is, what about our passion for the house of God? Did Jesus have enough passion for all of us? No, we need to have our own passion for the house of God. Now, some people are, are passionate about religious things. Some people are passionate about the routine of church, but are you passionate about Christ and what the purpose of the house of God is for? I mean, the purpose of the house of God is for people to come to church and get born again. And then for us that are born again, that we are sanctified, that we are growing in Christ to help other people get born again. Now we've all been through some amazing changes, right? Not only have we faced a crisis, but we faced many crises within a crisis. Many challenges within a challenge. And as we've gone through this over the last year, it's amazing how the entire globe, and I don't have to remind you, so I'm not saying this to remind you, I'm just saying this to bring a point. You know, we had the whole globe shut down. The whole globe 
the majority of the globe was in fear and panic mode. The majority of the globe was concerned about their mortality and the frailty of life. What that meant was at no other time on the face of the planet was our earth and the populace on the earth more primed to receive the gospel message to be b- become born again than now. And what did we do? We shut the doors and we closed down. Think about it. People were scared about dying and we have the very solution. And what do we do? We shut down. We called church YouTube. Come to my YouTube channel. It's just a supplement. We've talked about that, right? Live stream is just a supplement. Those of you that have been sick and you stayed at home and watched, you're like, dude, just you just want to tear a hole in the door so you could be here because it doesn't replace this. We had the greatest opportunity and yet the church as a whole fell silent. And now we have groups trying to change what the house of God is. They're trying to change the house of God. The moment that the government gets involved in church is the moment it becomes a church state ran government. The moment that we listen to what the government says and heed to the government on how we worship God, we are no longer a church, but we are a government run church. So people said, well, why didn't you stay closed? Because the government doesn't have a right to tell me how to worship God. And the only way you allow the government to have the right to tell you how to worship God is you stay closed. And you do what the government says on how to worship God. And now we have fear and intimidation and cancel culture. And it's right in our backyard, guys. It's here right now. Motion Church was going to host a speaker. Whether you like the speaker or not, that's neither here nor there. But they were going to host a speaker. And Antifa rose up, sent out death threats to the pastor, sent out threats to the churches and all of the local churches, including our church. That if they went ahead with this event, we would all be a target. And this is where we're at today. Do we sit quiet? Do we, do we become silenced? Or do we allow the passion of our hearts for the house of God to lead us and to drive us forward to do what God has called us to do? When Jesus said the passion, my passion for the house of God will be the end of me, he put his life on the line. In other words, he gave his life for the church. He died for the church. My question is, will we have people that will live for the church? I mean, we can't even start talking about dying for the church until we're starting to talk about, are we willing to live for the church? (laughs) Show up for church. Will we be intimidated? Now, he canceled the event. The pastor canceled the event, and I'm proud of him for doing that because you know what? Here's the reality that we deal with. We have to be good. What I mean by that, we have to be on our guard seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Groups like that only has to get lucky once. So... When you're passionate for the house of God, it doesn't mean that you become foolish and do stupid things. Jesus sat down and he made a whip. He made a plan. And this is what we do. We make a plan. We make a plan. This country is trying to divide us. They're trying to divide us because different people have different colors. So therefore, different color means, guess what? We need to be different and we need to be reminded about how different we are. And I'm confused about this because when we come to Christ, we're all one in Christ. 
We're all valued equally in Christ. In the eyes of Christ, we're all valued. And yet pastors are so afraid to talk about whites and blacks and Latinos and, and Asians and Hawaiians and Samoans and Filipinos. And the list goes on. But if you lift up Christ, you lift up every, every ethnicity. You see, those that are passionate for the house of God, first of all, I noticed if you're passionate for the house of God when COVID hit, I realized the passion for the house of God meant that people became less critical about the things they used to be critical about in the house of God. I mean, the complaints, what, and this is what I didn't understand because pastor shut down because of complaining. I opened up because of complaining. <laughs> pastor, when are we going to get together? Pastor, when are we going to have church? Pastor, we need to be, get, be together. Why? Because when you're passionate for the house of God, you're less critical about what other people are critical about. What would bother the typical person doesn't bother you anymore when you're passionate for the house of God. I mean, think of it this way. Um, the music doesn't seem as loud as it used to. The temperature doesn't seem as hot or cold as it used to. The parking lot doesn't seem as full or doesn't seem to bother you as much as it used to. Them talking about money at church doesn't seem to bother you as much because now it all makes sense. Now the priorities are in the right order and alignment that we understand what's most important. People getting saved, families being healed. The, the other thing I noticed about people that are passionate for the house of God, it literally gave them a sense of shared responsibility or shared accountability. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. It's, it's kind of like um, people would talk to me, you know, in years past, and they'd, they'd been coming to the church for six months or a year, and they'd look at me and they say, yeah, yeah, we've been coming to your church. And I'm like, excuse me? How long you been coming here? Oh, about a year, about two years, you know, it's, it's, and you're still calling it your church because that means it, it, it's about, well, when there's problems, they're your problems. There's no sense of responsibility, right? Right now, when my boys were born, right? When our boys were born, oh, baby, baby, right? Right, mamas? When your child was born, baby, baby. But when your child gets older, suddenly you're saying, your son, your daughter did this. Your son, your, do your dog did this. See, the moment that there's challenges, we release responsibility and we say, oh, it's your fault. You fix it. But when you're passionate about it, you join in the collective responsibility to say, I'm a part of the solution. Look, nobody's going to be more excited about your church than you are. It's kind of like, you know, I, I got my truck and I put a, a, a winch on it. Why? Because I plan on getting stuck. <laughs> well, good's a truck. If you can't get it stuck, then get a winch to get you out, right? Oh, 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 more power, right? <laughs> and so I was so excited. I was like outside of the, the, the shop door, you know, the, the, the roller door. It was down and it had windows in it. And I'm out there like, I'm what? I'm excited. I noticed the mechanic wasn't as excited as I was, <laughs> Right? Because it wasn't his truck, it wasn't his winch, and it wasn't going to be his experience. But I was excited. See, nobody's going to be more excited about the vision that God gives you than you. But you got to be passionate about it. The other thing that passion will do is it will help you understand the difference between being excited about something and being passionate about something. See, excitement will get you engaged. Passion will keep you married. Excitement will get you engaged, but passion will keep you married. 
And all of those that have been married 30, 40, 50 years know what I'm talking about. I mean, excitement comes and excitement goes. I, not for me, though. I'm always excited, honey. Okay? No, I mean, that's just a part of life. Emotions. Emotions go like this. How many of you woke up this morning and said, I feel married? Right? It's not about feelings, but passion will drive you through the tough times. The challenging times when you got kids and they're crying and they're tired and you're tired and... Let's move on. You know, the 72, they were so excited that it's found in Luke 10, 17. I'm not going to read all of this, but they were so excited because they returned after God empowered them. Jesus empowered them. And they weren't passionate, though. They were excited. They came back so excited saying, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Even the demons obey us. He says, yeah, yeah, I know. I was there when Satan was kicked out of heaven. I kicked him out of heaven. The reason they obey you is because of me. So he said, don't rejoice. Don't take credit for what I'm giving you power to do. See, they got excited about the wrong thing. And then Jesus had a reality check for him. Later on, he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you won't go to heaven. And you know what they did? They realized they weren't as passionate as they thought. And they tapped out and they left. And this was so, so cataclysmic that Jesus looked at his own disciples and said, you going to leave me too? Are you going to leave me too? Or are you passionate like I'm passionate for the house of God? I think we have to realize that there are some people that will not take this journey with us. And, and if you think that church is going to get easier, no. I think it's going to get better. But I don't think it, and what I'm saying is, it's not going to be as easy as it used to be to be a compromising Christian. It's not going to be as easy as it used to to be a Christian that holds two opinions. It's not going to be as easy as it used to for a Christian to stand on the crack trying to balance this little line of saying, well, I agree here, but I like this. I still want to go to heaven, but I don't want to lose my relationship, my connections, and my influence with the world. See, excitement, it might get you to the game, but it won't keep you in the game. Man, I'm so excited to come to church. And guess what? They got saved. But the Bible says the cares of the world stole the seed. The parable of the sower. See, passion isn't going to thrive on a single sermon but it will thrive on a single revelation. Well, I just need another sermon. No, you need another revelation. See, Romans 12, 11 says, be fervent in the spirit, which means to be white hot. It's the hottest temperature when you start to measure temperature. White hot. What do we need to do to maintain and to kindle the passion that God has put in us? What do we do that when things get more challenging and more difficult, because if you think we're going to go back to the way it used to be, uh, uh, I just want whatever God wants. I want people to get born again. I want people to quit playing games with God. I want people to say they're either in or they're out. So just three, three little easy things. First of all, you got to feed the fire. You got to feed the fire. My dad's here on the front row and um, we had a house in Tyner, Indiana. It was where people went to go hide from the world because it was a small town, dead town. Bought this house. He did, not me. I just lived there. Bought this house, it had 52 windows. Now, that's not a compliment because in the winter, you could see your curtains go. 
We lived with electric blankets. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but dad, uh, he made a wood stove, a wood furnace stove. This was early on. You know, we had a fireplace. You know, you come down in the morning, you're freezing, and you make a fire, right? And you just, <laughs> right? You try to get some heat going because it's cold in the house. So he built a wood furnace. This wood furnace, though, you do something before you go to bed at night. Everybody, you stoke the fire. You put fuel in it. And then you moderate how much oxygen is getting to the fire so it just doesn't burn up all at once. But that way it burns through the night, maintaining heat, so that way in the morning you can add more fuel and you're still going to have hot coals there to keep the fire going. You have to understand what feeds your fire, what stokes you. I, I want to talk about two opposing things here. One is seclusion. The other is isolation. Jesus used seclusion many times because he withdrew himself to refuel. He re withdrew himself to stoke his passion. See, seclusion is a decision that you make for the health of yourself. Okay, seclusion is where you go to build yourself up. There's a set purpose and a set time period. Well, how long are you going to be gone? I'll be gone this long because I know I can't be gone too long. Because there's a purpose to my passion. But what we've been facing is what is called isolation. Isolation. Isolation is where <clears throat> other people determine where you go and what you do. Isolation, many times we think isolation is simply just putting you and courting you off from the rest of the world. But isolation literally is just to remove your identity, your sense of individuality, the sense that God made you distinct and unique and you have a distinct purpose in your life. See, isolation is meant to kill your passion. Isolation is um, basically something that will pull from your heart. And some of you know what I'm talking about because you had been so isolated for so long, you lost grip of reality. And when you're in isolation, you, sen you lose sense of time. You lose sense of priority. And you lose sense of rationality. And the enemy has tried to isolate us, tried to remove your personality, your individuality, who God has gifted you. And you have to determine that I will not be isolated. There might be times I need to seclude myself. There might be times that I need to go stoke myself and build the fire so I can come back. Because you know what? If you're going to stoke the fire, you can't be somewhere else doing something else. You can't, well, I got to go chop wood. I got to stoke the fire. Great. That means you're chopping wood. You're not stoking the fire. By the time you're ready to stoke the fire, it could be out. So you got to stoke the fire. Number two, you got to stir the fire. Not only do you stoke it, but you stir it. In the morning, you get up and there it is. It's it, some of it's just congealed, it's all together, logs are together, and, and, and it just seems like there's not much life to it. So what do you do? You get the poker and you start poking it, and you stir it, and all of a sudden those embers come alive and flames, and it just comes out of nowhere. Why? Because somebody poked and stirred around something that was there, the potential that was in there got stirred up. And this means that you have to determine who can be in your life to tell you no. Who can be in your life that can poke you? Hey. Hey, a poke doesn't feel good. We're not talking a tap, we're talking a poke, a rib shot, like, hey. I mean, wives have those ninja fingers, mm, with nails, mm, right? <laughs> Real deal. And make sure that you have somebody that just doesn't want to watch you burn, but they'll burn with you. They'll burn with you. 
So you stoke the fire, you poke the fire, then you fan the fire. You fan the fire. Fire needs oxygen. Heat, fuel, oxygen, three things. What environment are you creating that will fan your fire? What are you listening to that will fan your fire? It's interesting, we'll be talking to kids, or kids' parents, and uh, like teenagers, parents of teenagers, and they'll go, I just don't understand, something's changed in my son or my daughter's life. My first question, who are they with? Who are they listening to? Who's fanning their fire? Who's poking them? Who, what, what are they feeding on? It's very simple to find out what the root cause is. You just got to find it. Sometimes you might have to turn the mattress over. Sometimes you just might have to take the door off the room. Well, I could never do that to my son's room, my daughter. Yeah, you can because it's not their room. It's your room. You pay the bills. You heat that room. You air condition that room. You electrify that room. You take the door off that room. You say, that's my door, not your door. You want a door? Act like a man, act like a woman. Act like a man of God. You'll get a door of God. Why? Because when you have learned how to stoke your fire, stir your fire, and fan your fire, you're ready to light somebody else's fire. I think we are primed for a breakout of revival and an awakening in this country. I think we are. Because we're finally, finally dealing with the infection. The infection's finally coming to the surface, and you can't deal with it until it comes to the surface. We're going to have to lance it. We're going to have to drain it, get all that pus out of there. Come on. We're going to have to pack it. Oh, Pastor, that's gross. It's real. Sin is gross. Sin is gross. And when you start dealing with the world, guess what? You better buckle up. You better have some, some veracity in your heart and some capacity in your heart to deal with some of the challenges that real people are dealing with. People in this room are dealing with. Oh, bless God, I'm just so prim and proper in the mind of God. Life's not so prim and proper. You have no idea the hell that some of kids are dealing with in this, in this area. And I just, I just want you to know that, you know, we think King County's whacked crazy. So um, some of the chaplains that were a part of Pierce County, they were comparing the amount of diversity of calls and the craziness of calls that they had in Pierce County compared to all the other counties combined on this side of the corridor. And it was not even comparable, the things that are being dealt with in Pierce County at a family level at a personal level. You know what that means for us? Opportunity. Are you passionate for the house of God? And look, you, you may not be passionate about this house. You need to find a house that you can be passionate about. You may not be passionate about this message, about this preacher, about this worship, about this church, but you need to find a church that you can be passionate about and plug in and give your life to. You want everything else to fall in line, you give your life to God. You give your heart to the church, and guess what? God will write everything else for you. Priority. Father, we thank you for your wisdom, your guidance, your strength. We thank you, Lord, that you guide us into all truth today. Father, strengthen our hearts. Father, where we have been weak, make us strong. Because it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit. It's by your spirit working in us and through us. In Jesus' name. If you're here today and you're not serving Christ, you're not born again, if that's you watching live on the internet, there's no greater decision to make than that 
of your future, which is your eternal outcome. This life is but a vapor. It's but a breath. It's but a stroke of the clock. It's here one day and gone the next. And life as we know it is so fragile. You have no idea what you hold in your future. But there's one thing that you can be certain of, and that is your eternal outcome. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That doesn't mean you cease to exist. It means that you will go to hell for an eternity. And look, God, he, he didn't make hell for us. He made hell for the devil and his angels. But if you don't choose to follow Christ, then you choose the outcome of the devil and his angels. And that is to burn in hell for an eternity. That is a reality that cannot be escaped unless you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. We're not talking about being christened. We're not talking about going to confirmation. We're not talking about being on somebody's prayer list or attending church. We're talking about surrendering to the truth that Jesus Christ is your Lord. And you've asked him to forgive you of your sin. So we're gonna pray with those that are watching live on the internet, but if that's you here today in this room and you wanna to surrender to Christ, maybe it's the very first time, or maybe, you want to renew your relationship with God because you become distracted and you want to renew your passion with God. It's very simple. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to ask you to count. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to ask you to lift your hands when I say three. And if that's you today, we're going to pray this prayer together. And you're going to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And your name is going to be written in the Lamb's book of life. If you do that today, and then you're going to meet with our prayer partners because this is the best decision of your life. So if that's you here today, you're ready to surrender to Christ, to renew your relationship with Christ, we're gonna pray with those that are online as well, but here it is, one, get ready to lift it up, two, get ready, here it is, three, one. Yes, I see that hand, yes, I see that hand. Anyone else? Awesome. Anyone else? All right, church, pray this prayer, right there, yes. Let's pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin. I accept your son Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Live in me as I live for you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. Come on, stand as we sing it.